Enjoyed by 2.3 million visitors, Le Puy de Fou has become one of France's favorite destinations. Its spectacular shows have thrilled the public through its riveting productions and the sophisticated engineering behind its ever more sensational effects. The technology is at the service of artistry. You don't make machinery just for the sake of it. Emotion is the goal. To reach that goal, the park's creative teams enlist the best and brightest technological talent to create machinery unlike anything else in the world. We call in companies from the automotive and aeronautics industries. This isn't some little lab doing experiments to see what happens. It's immediately tackling with huge categories. The park engaged aviation specialists to calculate the structural requirements for the titanic Valarium that covers the gigantic Gallo-Roman arena. We spent almost a million euros when we began our studies. The word fou in pou de fou means mad, and we love this touch of madness, meaning we like to be excessively daring. Nothing scares us. We tackle some humongous projects. Technology is such a large part of the park's DNA that it has revolutionized the entire creative process. Each new show is now modeled in 3D. We're aware that this is a turning point in our creative approach here at Pou de Fou. Across its 200 hectares, nothing is left to chance. The Vendian Park has set up a system to manage the scarce but vital lifeblood of its shows, water. We face several heat waves a year. We are under significant water stress. We really need to regard water as a commodity that cannot be wasted. Come behind the scenes to discover the secrets of several iconic shows. Le Cine de Triomphe in the colossal Gallo-Roman Stadium. Le Dernier Penache, a crucible of innovations. Or Le Chevalier de la Table Ronde. And then we'll take an exclusive look at the park's latest lavish creation, Le Mime et l'Etoile. We took a lot of risks. It's the biggest investment in live entertainment in France and even Europe. We wanted to produce something that had never been seen before and may never be seen again. Here's how a simple local show, created in the heart of the Vendéen Bocage, grew into a one-of-a-kind park whose entertainment innovations now attract and intrigue the whole world. In the Vendée, 80 kilometers from Nantes, 90 from Angers, and a three and a half hour drive from Paris, an extraordinary production operation is underway. Le Mime et l'Etoile, also known as Mimo. Bonjour, messieurs, vous allez pouvoir avancer tranquillement. The show has been three years in the making and is shrouded in secrecy. The teams involved have made sure there are no leaks about this eagerly awaited show based on the early days of cinema. Today, the people that come to Pou de Fou are people that watch TV and go to the movies. They're used to being impressed by big shows, so yes, they have higher expectations now. But it's a demand that inspires us. As with every new concept, the Pou de Fou adopts the same approach. First, the artistic teams are given carte blanche. We start by studying everything we want to put into the show. We're like kids making their Christmas list to Santa Claus, cramming everything in. Later, we have to adapt to fit our budget, but at first, it isn't a consideration. The park's huge ambition allows the script writers to think big. It's a show that's going to cost over 20 million euros, so it's a significant investment. The largest in live entertainment in France and even in Europe. You see things in Poudifou shows that haven't been seen anywhere else. They're bold right from the start, on a huge scale. This isn't some little lab doing experiments to see what happens. It's immediately tackling huge categories. The first important consideration is the venue. One of the Poudifou's golden rules is that the show must never need to adapt to the building. The building itself has to be created to meet the show's artistic ambitions. It's a challenge for builders. We're working to a very tight schedule to have as little impact as possible on the seasons. 18 months of construction for a new hall is quite a short time. The specifications were extremely precise. The hall had to cover 4,000 square meters, measuring 69 meters long, 66 meters wide, and 16 meters high. To resemble the film sets of the time, it had to take on the appearance of a late 19th century industrial building. With brick cladding and metal paneling, 
as well as being able to accommodate all the latest technologies. The building's main specifications were shaped by the imposing nature of the MIMO machinery. The teams relied on groundbreaking technologies and processes, incorporating huge, fast-moving conveyor belts combined with an ingenious dolly system to transport unwieldy 150-ton sets. You don't make machinery just for the sake of it. The objective here at the Pou de Fou is to make visitors laugh and cry so that they don't leave our shows unmoved. The technology is actually just a means to an end in the service of emotion. Once those of us working on the artistic side have imagined things that seem overambitious and impossible to achieve, who do we get in touch with? Who is going to tell us, well, that seems feasible? With such huge artistic challenges, the Puy de Fou seeks out manufacturers capable of designing ultra-sophisticated prototypes. We turn to companies working in the automotive and aeronautics industries who bring a very different perspective to whatever effect we have in mind because they think from a purely technical, not artistic point of view. Practicality allied to innovation in order to introduce the element of surprise. Le Puy de Fou's trademark is to create emotions by astonishing the spectator. We wanted to do something that had never been seen before and may never be seen anywhere else in the world. Spectators may not realize it, but modern technology is all around the Puy de Fou, with millions of euros invested to ensure that audiences are constantly impressed and surprised. However, when the adventure began, there was nothing to suggest that the park would become a flagship of modern technology. The Puy de Fou began life as a rundown chateau in the middle of the Vendée Bocage. Then, one evening in the summer of 1978, Philippe de Villiers, along with a handful of volunteers, launched an amateur but ambitious show in front of 2,000 people. Le point de départ, c'est le poteau, là, des projecteurs. The history of Pou de Fou began almost half a century ago with the Cine Cine, its very first show held at night on a stage that has since become the biggest in the world. Today, 2,600 actors are on stage every night. There were to be only eight performances. Yet almost half a century later, the Cine Cine still exists. Its legend has grown because from the very outset, it stood out for its epic spirit as much as for its technical innovations. Right from the first year, we brought the Cincinnese technology up to the world's best multi-channel standards, particularly in terms of sound, on a huge 12-hectare stage. You see, I the memory the founders instinctively knew that the future of the Puy de Fou would depend on three things. Innovation, a desire for new challenges, and a spirit of independence. When my father launched the first show at Puy de Fou, he felt he had to do it all himself. It's an approach that has allowed us to have machinery to rival the world's best shows, because from the very beginning, we had this desire to create things in-house rather than buy them in from outside. From then on, the pace of growth accelerated. Ten years after the startup, in 1988, the Parc de Puy de Fou was opened. The initial idea for the park was to recreate villages using craftsmen to bring to life a whole range of regional folklore, but we realized this wasn't enough. We needed to create shows. The park has continued to grow bigger every year. Today, it boasts some 20 shows across a 200-hectare site, with 2,500 employees or seasonal workers, all driven by the challenge of making a lasting impression through original creations staged in imposing settings. The desire to bring this small Vendée park into the major league began in the early 2000s with the construction of a 20-meter-high mobile dungeon and most of all, by a crazy project dreamed up by the entire artistic team. In the beginning, we started out talking about the Gallo-Roman era, and of course, we all had Ben Hur's race in mind. The mention of Rome conjures up an amphitheater. That would be huge. Well, let's do it anyway. 
A year later, in 2000, construction work began in earnest. The intention was to build a replica of the Colosseum in Rome. Signing a huge check to erect an 8,000-seat arena for a show was the biggest investment of the year in terms of live entertainment. Financially, it was a phenomenal risk. The most important element is the cavea, the track itself, then the spina, the platform that sits in the middle of the cavea around which the chariot race takes place, then lastly the construction of the tribunes and gangways. It was folly to build a 7,000-seat Roman arena of this size in the heart of the Vendée Bocage. It took 140 years for the Colosseum to be built, and barely a year and a half for the Gallo-Roman equivalent at Le Puy de Fou, which was opened in 2001. Its dimensions are monumental. Standing 115 meters long and 70 meters wide, the project required 3,600 cubic meters of concrete, 150 tons of steel, and the installation of three kilometers of prefabricated concrete tiers. The spectator's first glimpse of the building itself is a view of the amphitheater looming up out of nowhere in the Vindi Bukash, a reconstruction of the Colosseum, quite magnificent. But this reconstruction of the amphitheater was to go even further. Ten years later, the teams decided to reproduce an emblematic feature of the Colosseum for the first time in 2,000 years. When it's 35 degrees Celsius down in the heart of the arena, the temperature is almost 60 degrees Celsius, so the idea soon came about to cover the amphitheater with awnings, as was done in Roman times. In Roman times, 240 Navy personnel were on hand to deploy what was known as the Valerium, a huge awning to cover the spectators. The Valerium at the Colosseum was 22,000 square meters, and doing the math here at the Pou de Fou, we ended up with over 6,000 square meters of cover. At the time, we spent almost a million euros on our studies. Thousands of hypothetical calculations were carried out by the consultants specializing in aeronautics. Everything had to be carefully studied. The sturdiness and, more importantly, the stability of a structure and awnings protecting 7,000 spectators in the event of a violent gale. It's a huge surface area, and calculations based on wind load, rain load, and resistance took two years of study. Could it be done? Could we afford it? And what couldn't we do? In 2011, the Valerium was inaugurated and immediately integrated into the stage set. J'en appelle à notre divin empereur pour que le Vélarium du Colisée descende sur vous. The canopy unfolds in just one minute above the spectators. The technical solution decided upon was this. The Valerium rests on two steel hoops like bicycle wheels. The one on the outside, placed on the structure of the building, weighs 100 tons. It is flexible enough to move a few centimeters. The inner hoop weighs 34 tons. It is raised 11 meters above the audience, held in place by a system of 188 cables linking it to the outer hoop, and 12 vertical stays running from the ground to the inner hoop. All assembly parts have been designed to offer increased strength allied to reduced weight. When the Valerium unfurls, 144 awnings cover the arena, a total of 5,600 square meters of cover weighing in at two tons. The awnings are driven by motors, with one motor driving four awnings. So we have 36 motors on the entire site, all synchronized and automated. If the wind speed exceeds 35 kilometers per hour, the canopy automatically retracts. In the event of an emergency, another safety system is provided. The awnings are all separate, attached to each other using little metal clips, which act as fuses. In other words, if there's a strong gust of wind, to prevent the structure from being blown off, the fuses will break so that the awnings blow away, but the structure won't be broken, thus ensuring the safety of the public below. As well as the colossal arena, 
What lingers in the memory is the famous chariot race. The chariot race is iconic, a standard bearer of the Poo de Fou's expertise. We're fortunate and honored to have nine of the world's 15 or so chariot racers at the Poo de Fou. So as you can see, this really is an exceptional achievement. Nothing is left to chance. This show distills a wide range of innovations and well-oiled mechanics. For the chariot race, you have wheel braking. So we did lots of tests with the constructor, towing the chariot into a nearby field, then having to tow it back to weld it back together again before trying again. Even the track is the fruit of many years' work. Every detail was studied to ensure the safety of the carriages, as well as the comfort and visibility of the spectators. It has two layers of sand, a draining sand along with the finer sand, with fiber inside to hold the moisture in to ensure the sand stays packed and minimize dust. With 16 horses galloping along a track at speeds of around 40 kilometers an hour, a chariot race kicks up a lot of sand. In 2022, after 21 years of the show, the writers decided to rewrite the entire ending. They were a bit out of date compared to the other new releases we'd done since 2001, so we needed something new. To that end, we did some historical research about an activity people didn't really know about that we felt was important for us to bring to the fore, called Nomakia, which involves the reenactment of naval battles. The park's teams looked for a way to allow a boat to sail in the middle of the amphitheater. Once again, as children, we've all played with small objects, like that little truck that turns into a robot. Now we've come up with a way to turn our spina, the central section, into a galley. The design office wanted to fit everything in. It has to be 15 meters high, 32 meters wide, and it has to turn and fit in that space, so how? Engineers built a prototype that could be set up and made to turn. However, it weighed 110 tons, the equivalent of a lifting crane. The requirement was for the galley not to touch the sand to avoid damaging the track. As such, it needed to be rested on two ultra-strong 32-meter-long beams. Beneath the beams was dug a 3-meter-high technical pit, complete with all the hardware needed to move the galley. At the far end is housed the key element, a slewing ring 2 meters in diameter. The ring is used like the ones fitted to wind turbines, driven by a motor to turn it on its axis. The whole system allows the galley to begin its choreographed appearance. First, 48 oars rise up 6 meters before being activated. Once the oars have emerged, the obelisk is open to reveal the mast, an 8-meter structure on two hydraulic jacks. So again, it's impressive when it opens. The mast then rises from 8 to 15 meters. So within a minute and a half, a galley appears out of nowhere in the arena. In full rotation, the galley projects imposing flames just a few centimeters from the stuntmen. For this fire effect, we use two products, which are gas, along with a type of petroleum called isopar, which burns at very low temperatures. This impressive effect is backed up by extensive safety measures. On each side of the stage, we have actors with a dead man's handle, or emergency stop. At a precise moment in the script, they watch out for any potential issue, and if they are in the slightest doubt, they release their grip. Nothing is ever risk-free, so it's important for the safety of our shows and our actors. Each new season is an opportunity for the park to reinvent itself and show the public its latest creations. Only a month to go before Le Mime et Puis Puy de Fou's brand new show, is open to the public. 20 million euros have been invested in this journey through time, back to the Belle Époque, during the very early days of cinema. For the show, we have a turn-of-the-century director who believes that for silent and black-and-white cinema to become talking and colorful, there is only one solution, which is for two actors to fall deeply in love with each other in front of his camera. While the basic idea may seem simple, the creation of intense emotion brings with it many technical challenges, met through the use of a wide range of hidden machinery. 
The first challenge was black and white. We've never done that at Poudrefeu, and it's very rare. So while it's easy to do a black and white filter on a video, it isn't just a matter of putting black and white glasses on the viewer's eyes. They see in color, whereas everything we present has to be seen in black and white, so that's much more complicated. It took months to successfully recreate black and white artificially through makeup, lighting, sets, and costume colors. But the big technical challenge was meeting a set of precise artistic requirements. The show needed to be like a traveling shot, i.e. in constant motion. That meant moving the audience, which proved to be too complicated. You'd need a 2,000-meter-long hall on a 2-kilometer site. It's just not feasible. So we needed to move the actors and the set. A conveyor belt system was dreamed up, but the precise nature of the specifications stymied the designers on a number of technical points. A conveyor belt is a common enough piece of equipment, but the precise nature of our specifications proved to be problematic during the design process. We need conveyors that move in both directions, forwards and backwards. In an airport or on the subway, conveyor belts usually go in only one direction. They can't be reversed. Also, for safety reasons, they go very slowly, whereas we needed one that went fast, at almost 10 or 12 kilometers an hour. Those just don't exist on the market. We found the technological solution for this conveyor belt while chatting to the technicians during a relaxing trip to the La Plagne ski resort. We realized that the conveyors and ski resorts were robust and could withstand the cold. They carry thousands of skiers, and those are the conveyor belts we'll be using for our show. The selected technology, then, is the type used on cable cars. Two rubber conveyor belts were built, one 39 meters long, the other 36 meters long, each capable of running in either direction. As well as being robust, they can withstand humidity, water, and artificial snow, as well as the weight of actors and vintage cars. They are designed to handle 1,400 performances per season. They travel at a speed of 8 kilometers an hour, allowing the actors on set to move either in the same direction or in the opposite direction. This can produce interesting speed effects for the show. It's set in motion by two synchronized 15 kilowatt motors per belt, so we have 30 kilowatts per belt. In this show, it wasn't just a case of allowing the actors to move around. We needed to set an extremely large number of sets in motion. It's a 14-module set weighing 150 tons. To transport these 10-meter-high sets, a huge dolly system was set up, along with a pit and a rail along the ground, to which carriages and a motor unit could be attached. We have a set of 12 engines assembled in pairs, so six groups of two engines. We've also made sure that if any of them break down, we can keep things running. There's a degree of overkill to the cover provided for any potential breakdowns. The scenery can go up to 12 kilometers an hour, giving the sensation of racing through a small French town in the early 20th century. For this show, another prototype has been specially designed to amaze young and old alike. Our show features a little magician who can transform the objects on a carousel into reality. For example, he turns a miniature Venice gondola into a big Venice gondola. The audience understands that a small version of whatever is on the carousel is turned into a big one. At the very end, our actors choose to ride in a small plane. The carousel spins, we leave a few seconds of suspense while the audience are thinking, no way, not in a theater. Then a biplane, as if in full flight, rises just above the crowd. The plane starts up and accelerates powerfully to six meters on its initial run. This aircraft travels at a speed of 22 kilometers per hour. 
A motor sets a cable in motion, then the cable does everything. The whole trajectory of the plane is controlled by a pulley, rather like a cable car. The aircraft, inspired by the models used during the First World War, is mounted on a 62-meter long rail. For safety reasons, the aircraft obviously has to be ultra-light. It was developed by a company specializing in model train sets and weighs just 120 kilos. We have a system of retention trays beneath the mechanics so that any tiny part falling off is collected in this tray, so there's no risk of mechanical parts falling on the public. This device isn't the only surprise to appear in the sky. The creators came up with another magical effect. The artistic idea was for a flame from the lamppost to create a ring around the actor who magically disappears off stage. So we used a drone and the effect is truly magical. One of Puy de Fou's trump cards is its drones, developed for their nighttime show, Cine in 2014. With 50 engineers, the Vendée-based brand has developed and patented a drone model called Neopter. The 30-strong fleet is piloted by a single operator, the drones are able to fly simultaneously at a height of 60 meters and a speed of 20 kilometers per hour. And as they fly at night, they are invisible. It includes luminous objects weighing up to six kilos. The drone revolution has allowed us to create this type of effect. We take an existing technical element, the flight of drones, and transform it into a new artistic effect. For the new show, the use of drones led to a hitch Unlike Cinecini, the fleet could not be guided by satellite. GPS doesn't work well indoors. It's imprecise because of all the metal building materials, which block or interfere with the waves passing between the atmosphere and the ground position. So we have to use another technology called ultra-UVB. Dozens of antennae are positioned throughout the building to allow the drones to locate each other via a triangulation system and perform their choreography in complete safety. We didn't want the drones themselves to be visible, just the object they were highlighting. The machinery brings reality. What we wanted was something supernatural. Le mime et l'étoile. After three years of preparation, the teams now await the verdict of press and public at the grand premiere. Just a few meters from Le Mime et l'Etoile stands another building, dubbed the Theater of Giants. It was here in 2016 that a series of worldwide innovations were developed to meet a set of extraordinary artistic requirements. This show, Le Dernier Panache, tells a story like a road movie, whose hero wanders from one setting to another. You have to come up with a concept and a way of staging the show that allows you to smoothly take the spectator from one setting to another without breaking the emotion. In what was a world first, it's the audience itself that moves thanks to a rotating grandstand. First, a prototype was built with seats placed on a disc operated from below by a system of motors. But for many months, one requirement proved to be problematic. The stand had to move without the spectator noticing. Then one day, after much toing and froing and a great deal of trial and error, the moment came when we sat down and closed our eyes, and I said, OK, go. Then after a few seconds, I repeated, go ahead, you can start now, and insisted that he started up. In fact, I was already moving but didn't realize it. That's when we knew we had successfully met the challenge of setting up this gigantic technology to rotate 2,400 people without breaking the excitement of the show. The Tribune is a large turntable driven by 18 engines. It weighs 207 tons, empty, and 500 tons when loaded with its 2,100 spectators. We have eight tracks on which it is towed and turned. The Tribune, able to rotate twice on itself, that is, through 720 degrees, was validated on paper. But a venue still had to be built, and the show designed within a 14-month period. The urgency and complexity of the show compelled the teams to revolutionize their creative process. 
It was very complicated. This was the first show we'd created like this, and we couldn't imagine it without 3D, so that became a natural part of our creative process. Without the computer visualization, we couldn't understand each other around the table. You've got construction workers and steel workers building the hall, as well as the costume designers, lighting designers, etc. All these different professionals need to understand each other and work together on the same project. It's unprecedented. We were aware that this was a turning point in our creative approach here at Fudapu. It's been a crazy adventure. The software, called Blender, allows potential hitches to be anticipated and last-minute surprises avoided as far as possible. We know that our construction schedules are always very tight. The venue is rarely delivered before the actors arrive, so we're still painting, setting up and testing machinery when the actors come in during rehearsals. Since the whole process is in-house, rehearsals can go much faster. Thanks to 3D, the teams were on schedule, but the new configuration of the hall still had to be rubber stamped by the authorities. Compliance with safety standards is a major challenge. We place the audience right in the center of the theater and surround them with sets, which is the very opposite of how theater works. We have the spectator on one side and the set on the other. We surround them. Regulations required us to increase the number of emergency exits, so we needed more than we had planned for. Six emergency exits instead of four. Fire regulations demand more guarantees in the event of a fire. The solution we found was an M0 rated curtain, that is, an incombustible material that we were able to present to our fire department, guaranteeing insulation against fire. The imposing 20 meter long, 11 meter high curtains can surround the entire stage in a matter of seconds, thanks to a 360 degree motorized track. Behind the curtains are sprinklers. The irrigation system waters the curtain at a rate of up to 48 liters per linear meter per minute, reducing heat in the event of fire. The Safety Commission asked them to go even further and prove the effectiveness of their dual system in the face of various fire scenarios. We went so far as to simulate a bus fire in a scene, releasing millions of calories of heat to see what impact it might have on the venue. We went up to a maximum heat potential of some 9 or 12 megawatts to show the fire department that our curtain was capable of holding out for up to an hour. The trick was to convert these curtains, designed as a safety measure, into a giant 280-degree projection screen. They are used to punctuate the show with spectacular images before opening onto real epic scenes. To put the audience at the heart of the action and produce even more excitement, a worldwide innovation has been developed, a revolutionary sound system. The ELISA system provides 360 degrees surround sound. The sound turns in perfect sync with the spectator, closely following the movement of the main actors when they speak, helping to put the audience right at the heart of this incredible adventure. No, profession. François Tanache Charette, 33 ans, officier de marine. While the modeling process saved a considerable amount of time for everyone involved, there were still one or two surprises. The choreography required this imposing two-ton mast to be folded away in less than one and a half minutes between scenes. It was epic at first. The first run through with the actors without costumes took over three minutes when we only had a minute and a half. It was the actors themselves who came up with the idea of sometimes changing costumes in different places, like moving the sets around to save time. I've often compared it to a pit stop. You have to change tires and refuel very quickly. That's what's going on for 34 minutes backstage during the show. In one crucial scene, the technical aspect almost derailed the actors and the entire control room. We have an actuator, a pusher mechanism behind the chapel, which pushes the hotel over a distance of around five meters. 
opening up the two wings and giving us a zoom effect for the public seated in the gallery. Suddenly, after more than 4,000 performances, the system jammed. Artificial snow had rusted the steel mechanism responsible for moving the chapel. The snow gave us a few technical issues, but those are the vagaries of show business. When you produce prototypes, you sometimes have to deal with premature wear and tear due to the combination of special effects and machinery, so you have to find ways of dealing with it. We've had a few difficulties to overcome. Glitches tend to come at an unexpected moment, and we have to use cunning to make sure the spectators don't notice any incidents during the show. With a rotating grandstand, monumental sets, and even a 60-meter water basin built to simulate the sea, the Puy du Fou has pushed realism to the heights. In 2017, an American jury voted Le Dernier Panache the best show in the world. Seen from the sky, there is an ever-present element on the visitor's route for which the teams have had to develop more ingenious solutions every year and the element is water. Why is water strategic? Because water is a spectacle. It's an important artistic element, every bit as important as the projection, sound, and lighting. A wide range of water-related technologies have been developed here, including fountains, which are relatively easy, along with the more complicated water screens. We were the first site in the world to produce fabulous nighttime projections on water screens. And there are all the other technological water features, such as aqua graphics, with which we can write using waterfalls. These are fabulous techniques perfected about 10 years ago here at Pou de Fou. Water is used in the Nocé de Fou show to create a magical universe. Water is also a key element in the iconic Chevalier de la Table Ronde show. First and foremost, it sets the pace in battle scenes. We have three air chutes, which is a system that allows us to spray water up to five meters into the air. Beneath the surface, a 100-liter compressed air cylinder is set at three bars of pressure. Just above it is a drum full of water. On command, a valve rapidly releases all the air which then projects the water above the combatants. The water then adds a spectacular touch as a knight literally glides across the surface. It's more like a surfboard. That was our inspiration in the first place. An underwater rail is laid along the entire trajectory with a watertight block around the rail containing the batteries and motors. A mast then connects it to a board located 10 centimeters below the water where an actor places his feet on a pedal. The mechanism provides a safety aspect. When he resheathes the sword in his scabbard, the actor triggers the carriage movement with the entire link made via Wi-Fi with the control room. But the most spectacular part of the show comes at the very end. The major special effect is obviously the water hole created in the middle of the lake. In a matter of seconds, thousands of liters of water disappear through two hatches into a large underwater room that previously contained 500 cubic meters of air. Once the pressure is compensated, air escapes and propels the water upwards. It's the grand finale, as the knight and his mount emerge from the depths of the round table. It's a first, so we're obviously very proud of the surprise we give our visitors. Water is now a major issue for the park because it's becoming increasingly scarce every year. The fact is, the Pou de Fou is on a hill. And right now we have a river that feeds the Pou de Fou site. We were under considerable water stress, and one year we almost failed to fill the Simsini Reservoir, and even bought in 100,000 francs worth of water. This was pre-Euro, to top up the water level at the Simsini. It was a disaster, and we said, never again. Since 1995, a special team has been monitoring the weather and water levels in all the pools, 24-7, 365 days a year. A software program collects data in real time, using weather sensors and probes in the ponds and in the soil. 
All this enables us to analyze the drought situation in real time and anticipate water shortages, notably with regard to levels in our pools, so we know when there won't be enough water for a particular show. We have to contend with several heat waves a year, and even droughts in winter, meaning that maintaining water levels in our pools is becoming increasingly difficult. For almost 30 years, Le Puy de Fou has been developing a comprehensive strategy. Our hydrological network is made up of 18 pools arranged as a cascade, meaning that the overflow from one runs into the next one down and so forth. We wanted to connect them so that we could manage water as a precious commodity, something to be preserved. To ensure nothing is lost, a pumping system enables water from the Sinisini pool to be pumped back to the other basins if necessary. Even rainwater falling onto the roofs is captured. Again, a major technological challenge has been tackled head on. We had to interconnect all the roofs all the underground networks, as well as the natural runoff so that we could recover rainwater whenever it falls and redirect it towards our pools. Another challenge has been attendance. 80,000 visitors in 1978, 720,000 in the mid-2000s, and three times as many today. Water requirements at the park's six hotels, 20 restaurants and sanity facilities have grown year on year. To treat this wastewater, the Puy de Fou built its own wastewater treatment plant in 1995. In 2020, the second generation biological plant will come on stream. Here you can see the buffer tank where the water arrives from the site's pump stations. First, it passes through the degreaser filter, which removes any large particles from the water that cannot be treated by the wastewater treatment plant. Next, two pretreatment cells neutralize charged water through the action of bacteria and oxygenation cycles. A final decantation process removes the sludge, which is sent off for methanization, while the clear water flows into four lagoons, then into one of the park's pools. 75,000 cubic meters of water are treated every year, the equivalent of 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools to meet all the park's water requirements. Millions of trees have been planted here at the Pou de Fou, and they all need to be irrigated. We have around 22 hectares of lawn that also need watering from time to time, in spring and in summer. We can be proud of the fact that on August 15th, after three heat waves, the water levels in the pools is still at its highest. That's quite an achievement. As the water is a show, it must be clean for the actors and dancers. And to ensure that all costumes drenched during the stunts or by the vagaries of the weather look as good as new for the start of the next show, the park has even developed its own logistics solution. Our male and female staff in the laundry have developed a new approach to what is a fairly traditional profession. You can see how, by rethinking their job, they've moved us forward and developed in-house know-how. A special laundry building was constructed to process the 90,000 pieces of costume on show throughout the park, from the outfits worn by actors to those worn by park employees as well as restaurant and hotel staff. On a daily basis, it might handle four to six and a half tons a day. It varies between 1.5 and 3.5 tons per day. Over 2022, for the whole season, we did 400 tons of laundry. The circuit runs like clockwork. Delivery staff collect the costumes from 70 different points in the park and take them to two laundry entrances one of which is dedicated exclusively to the items worn by animals. Our horses may wear costumes. For example, in the Secret de la Lange show, they carry strips across them called caparçon. They need impeccable costumes as well, so we have a washing machine and a dryer, especially for the animals' laundry. The clothes worn by the 2,200 Puy de Fou employees and seasonal workers are sorted as soon as they arrive. We check what's on them, whether they're wet from water, for example, or perspiration, and then dispatch them to the machines according to the type of soiling on the costumes. In high season, operated by a 26-strong workforce, 
the 12 machines and 11 dryers run continuously 24 hours a day. Washing times vary according to the fabric, with the shortest programs lasting 30 minutes and the longest taking an hour and a half. Depending on the materials, a bit of ironing or straightening may then be required. We have high-performance machines for handling shirts and pants. In addition to the costumes, towels and linen from the hotels are cleaned, ironed and folded in record time. Generally speaking, as soon as the laundry leaves the show, it's back on site four and a half hours later. To make the process as precise and methodical as possible, almost 40,000 pieces can be located by GPS at any time, thanks to the microchips gradually being fitted to all the costumes. Each site has tablets with QR code readers. If a garment is lost, we scan it and can see who it belongs to. So the process is simple. Either we put it back in the dirty laundry and deliver it to the right site, or find the person using it in the corresponding location. These chips can also be used to track the number of washes and anticipate the life of a garment. At the end of the process, each element is placed in a specific bin that has a warning light and an alarm which are activated in the event of an error. When ready, three times a day, delivery drivers return the clean laundry so the actors can prepare their costumes for the start of the next show. It's the big day for the technical and artistic teams. Final adjustments are being made before the curtain rises on the park's latest creation, Mime et l'Etoile. Just a few hours to go before the launch of a new show, which brings with it a great many artistic and technical challenges. So things are obviously pretty tense. We're being closely watched. I'm extremely nervous with stage fright, but I think it's the same with all the teams. When you've been involved in a project from inception to public performance, there's always a nagging fear. <laughs> 2,000 hand-picked spectators make the trip to the Vendée, including journalists, entertainment specialists, fans, and of course, the park's entire team are out in full force. There's always a tiny element of randomness with any machinery. Over the last few weeks, it's been our job to anticipate as much as possible and explain to actors and technicians what plan B is and what plan C is should anything go wrong. We need to make sure that any hitches aren't noticed by the audience. You can never be sure that something won't go wrong at the last minute, so there's a degree of tension. But we're used to that, and we need to turn it into something positive. It's a show where you don't give people time to applaud. You need to wait until the very end to see whether it worked or not. 27 minutes of tension, waiting for the audience's verdict. The final effect we were hoping to achieve bowled them over. We saw all the applause, so yes, the emotion was strong. Là, on est content que. On est. From a technical point of view, throughout the whole show, you're aware of where the key moments and what the various technical risks are. So it's a beautiful roller coaster of emotions. Then at the end, it's like a release, and you feel great satisfaction. We're happy, yet at the same time, it's hard to let go of a project and entrust it to someone else in complete confidence. It takes a lot of energy and built up fatigue. The team's work is a success. The focus is now on new creations, with a target of one new product every two years in France while continuing to accelerate international development.
The sense is that Poudafo is a universal model that can be adapted to any language or culture. Our success in the Netherlands, and then in the UK, led us to invest in Spain, where we own another park, Poudafo España. It isn't about just copying what we've done in the Vendée region. They take into account the area, the men and women, the history, and they can apply their technical know-how to make something that will appeal to local audiences. Le Puy de Fou is developing huge shows in Europe and the United States over the coming months. Nothing scares us. We tackle some humongous projects. Lots of ideas, lots of determination, always relentlessly rigorous. It's a risky business. Every year, every job, every project has been very risky indeed. Almost half a century after its first show opened, the Puy du Fou, now the second most visited park in France, continues its ascent, always on the lookout for new technical innovations to thrill and surprise increasing numbers of spectators.